<laughs> Praise the Lord. Wow. It has been a while. <laughs> and the last time that we heard from the perils of Pauline, she was stuck in the Green River Gorge, drowning. <laughs> Sometimes that's the way I felt. I uh, started the summer on um, April Fool's Day, as a matter of fact, with the Ekanu, my kayak. It's more like a canoe than a kayak, or more oriented, I would say, towards the style of what a canoe is, as opposed to what a normal person thinks of as a kayak. Kayaks are technically small, narrow boats that, you know, are based upon certain parameters, so they find themselves in classifications. They call them now touring kayaks. They call them light water kayaks. They call them sea kayaks. There's even now a certain amount of what they call rock gardening going on with kayaks. And that's the kind of kayak that has like a plastic shell that's real small and tiny and just barely enough room to fit your body in. And people go over rocks and waterfalls and do all kinds of cartwheels and they even have a new kind of kayaking that's underwater kayaking. A little weird, <laughs> that's all I could say. Well, Kayak Anu and I go back to April 1st. So at the beginning of April, we were going to, you know, learn kayaking from this kayak. And as we progressed, we learned a lot about kayaking. And then God began to use that in my life as a learning opportunity. You know, like he does with you in your everyday life. As a matter of fact, you're going to find out that life is about learning. It's about growing in the knowledge of Jesus, who is God's son, but also in the knowledge of our Father who created us. Many people don't actually believe in a creator, which that's okay. I mean, you know, you can not believe in air, you cannot believe in the sky, but does it change the nature of the sky or the air? The fact that you're breathing communicates the idea that there is air, and the fact that you can see something out there does seem to belie the idea that there is no sky. Of course there is. But to the person who doesn't believe, they won't believe. And that's what brings us to a place of understanding what life is all about. Life is experience. It's a continuation of something that is going on in a realization of using your mental process to evaluate information. Some people might call that religion also, or faith, but the fact is, it's life. God never said, I'm going to define religion any more than he said, I'm going to define marriage. There's a lot of people in Christianity today that want to define God and regulate or in some way inspire people to follow this image of who they say God is as opposed to what God says he is. Our teaching here at Vidivo Church, as well as in Vidivo, all Vidivos, especially Kayakanu, is the very fact that you can't put God in a box. You can't keep God on the inside when God is all about all sides. In other words, there's a lot of people that like to say, well, you know, I pick this side as opposed to that side. They'll pick the upside as opposed to the downside. They'll be positive as opposed to negative. And they're always seeming to go in one direction or the other trying to, in some ways, inspire themselves, maybe conspire for others to follow along, but in some ways, making God into their own image. That's okay. A lot of us, you know, have to, you know, deal with God in some way. So, in some minor way, each one of us has our own interpretation of a realization of how God has worked in our lives. 
we've been given certain facts that are listed in the Bible, but to say that the Bible is inerrant is kind of an interesting concept. It depends on who reads it. I mean, the person who's reading it for errors are going to find them. The person who's reading it to be no errors aren't going to find them. It's kind of like God has the ultimate joke on humanity because in it and in of itself, when you read the Bible without realizing that God is speaking through it, the Bible says you can't understand it. The Bible itself says that you won't comprehend it or even appreciate all that is contained therein. Matter of fact, the Bible even says that there's more that should have been but didn't get written that should it have been written, it would not have been enough books in the universe to contain all that the Bible could have. So it's kind of fun when, you know, you'll hear either evangelical Christians or some kind of Christian say, 66 books, 40 authors, or whatever they say. Well, not really. There's one, God. I mean, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Bible itself speaks of no way of saying you have to believe in God. It just simply starts off in the beginning, God. I mean, if you don't know that, well, you're out of luck. <laughs> you probably won't understand the Bible. And that's kind of why in Kayakanu and in Vidivo Church and this series that we're doing in Vidivo, we don't really want to go over old territory of repentance from works and, you know, telling you, well, you know, if you don't have God, you're not going to understand the Bible. We want to move on. You know, I mean, it's kind of like at some point in time you go, well, why am I reading the ABCs when I know that there's A through Z? And then you find out that, you know, there's a new math. And so A through Z is really A minus B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, L, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y. So A could equal A parenthesis parenthetical minus the star B through Z, or through Y, or no, through Z, you know, colon, slash, star, close mark, you know, hyphen, whatever, hashtag. That would be a, you know, logical, mathematical equation, and if you want to sit down and play, you know, with intellect, you know, and do what some think they're doing in theology, go ahead. Me? I think I'd rather be in a kayak. Now, that's kind of why I call this a kayakanoo, because there are people that built this boat, designed this boat, and call this inflatable boat a kayak. Well, I, I like that. You know, I mean, I'm kind of with them on that. It's a kayak. It's classified as a kayak. It looks like an inflatable kayak. It has two tubes on the sides. It has five tubes on the floor. They're joined by kind of a little plastic piece that kind of holds the tubes to the floor. And they kind of meet at each end, pointed, a kayak. Most people that nowadays do modern kind of thrill-seeking kayaking with whitewater, they choose this certain kind of Eskimo-style kayak where they can roll in a kayak. Do what's called the Eskimo roll. I'm in a boat. I kind of like being in the boat. I like feeling the security of my kayakanoo keeping me from the water below. I don't really want all the water in my kayak. I'd rather have my water outside the kayak. Now those people that do Eskimo rolls, they roll over their boat. Uh, they say it's for safety, but then they start doing it for fun. Yeah. Is that like religion, where a lot of people start learning and educate themselves in doctrines and dogmas for fun, when reality, you just use it, don't abuse it. And that's kind of the way we feel about Kayakanu right now. We want to use what God has given us and not abuse the time that God is living with us. Because life, as we said in the very beginning, is about learning and about existing 
and about experiencing God. I want to experience what it's like to take my boat off of the deck, which is where we're at. We're on the third floor of an upper deck, kind of looking out over the, well, it ain't the ocean, <laughs> but the masses. So they're called oceans sometimes in the Bible, but kind of looking out over humanity. And I'm saying, you know, those people get involved in politics. I don't really want to waste my time in politics because it seems to be the same thing every four years. Sometimes every two years. And they don't seem to be changing anything, really. It keeps repeating itself over and over and over again. Now, I've lived 40 years watching politics, and I probably would have voted the first time for somebody if they had even bothered to represent me like they say they do. Nobody has. So I prayed about it, and I've never voted, and probably still won't, because every year that I pray to vote, God says, no. And I say, well, you know, I may go back to God and ask him different questions. Like I said, well, God, he comes close. Isn't it like, okay, if I compromise some of what I believe in for the sake of the greater good of the whole? No. Isn't it better, God, that I vote for, you know, my conscience that, you know, I should maybe like give up this in order to get that and be a part of this in order to be a part of that. So that way I don't have to hold to the fact that I'm answering for my vote to you. No. Oh, so one on one. Yeah. Oh. Maybe I won't vote. Yeah. And so I know there are people out there that think that there's a social justice scale that somehow God has one in the Bible. No, no, no. So the same way with the kayak, the same way with life, the same way with voting, same way with being distracted. We're not going to get distracted by the fact that this is more like a canoe than a kayak. And that, you know, it's not a canoe because it's got tubes and it's got inflatable but that it's a kayak canoe. So this is my baby, my kayak canoe. And I tried to go out with it, inexperienced wise, on the Green River expedition I tried. And I really wasn't prepared. I wasn't fully educated. Oh, I was taught, as many of you are, in Bible schools or in some way, you know, a certain amount of principles like, you know, they call the basic doctrines, you know, that you've learned, or expositional teaching. Ooh, that sounds good. You know, but, you know, I had a certain amount of, you know, I've learned as you go, you know, kind of like your, you know, school of hard knocks. So I went down the river and, you know, obviously ran into disasters. <laughs> Great planning. I mean, I had everything, you know, that you see here, as well as some other things. And I've changed the boat since then because life happened to me and bad things happen to good people. And the bad things wasn't bad because it wasn't really a bad thing that happened to me, but a good thing. Because all things, according to what God says, work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So there is no bad thing that ever happens to good people. That's a false teaching. It's a false doctrine. As a matter of fact, it's Jewish and it's also wrong because even in the Talmud, it says, no, but there are a lot of people that like the book. You know, it's like one book of many, so I like it for what it's good for, but frankly, for me, it's not good for too much. What I do like is when I read something like, okay, Daily Light. You know, I read Daily Light, not faithfully, but pretty much, almost every day. One way or another, I always get Daily Light, you know, either in my eyes or in my mind or my thought process somehow, because... In some ways, I can't avoid the air that I breathe. I can't avoid the sunshine. I can't avoid the oxygen. I can't avoid the weather. I can't avoid the fact that my heart beats. I can't avoid the fact that my veins pump blood any more than I can avoid the fact that the Spirit of God dwells within me. So God brings to my mind, even if I don't read it, remembrance of what He has said to me. My wife often thinks that I'm a genius when it comes to knowing the scriptures because I comment on what I know. And at the time, what I know, I know. Now, five minutes from then, who knows? Whatever the Spirit of God is taking me, I may not know whatever it is that I did know back then. But usually, God will bring it to my remembrance. So it's kind of like, since I have this vertical 
communication with God by His Spirit. I don't need to remember or memorize all the time, you know, like a parrot, things that I'm not going to use or I don't be a part of my life. It's kind of like, um, I really don't need a motor. You know, electric motor would probably be nice in this kayak. It'd probably be wonderful to have in this kayak a little electric motor for trolling. But you know, it wouldn't be a kayak then. It would be a motorized boat. I don't want a motorized boat. Then I gotta have gas or electric. Then I gotta have this, that, and the other thing. And have you ever noticed that when you start changing something, you start adding things that you need to go with it? That's kind of what happens when you do something to the Word of God. Whenever you add to the Bible, you have to add an explanation of what you added. The Bible is a pretty big book. I really can't read it in one day. Why would I want to add to what's already there when I don't even read what's there in the first place? I think I need to stick with what I got in order that I might understand what it is that I got so I can probably get a handle on what it is I do got. Because if you don't got it, you don't get it. And if you don't get it, you don't got it. Meaning that if the Spirit of God isn't really speaking to you, why are you reading the Bible? I mean, you're just reading a book there. You're not really understanding by way of God speaking to you that the Bible isn't inerrant. The Spirit of God is. So, eliminating some of these false teachings, ideas, thoughts that Christian evangelicals or who knows, you know, maybe some cults and other people too have the same idea. Trying to put those to bed is what we want to do in this book. You see, one of the things that's true about Kayakanu and teaching is that we're going to be talking a lot about balance. <laughs> a lot about equilibrium, a lot about what floats your boat. <laughs> because if this boat don't got air in it, it ain't going nowhere. You get the picture here? So Kayakanu is really going to be a lot about the Spirit of God teaching us. Because the pneuma, pneumatic, is what the Spirit of God is called in the Greek. Now Greeks have one part of what God is, the pneuma. Now, he's also called the dunamis, which is dynamic, which is like explosive. Well, kind of hard to really explain explosive unless you pop a balloon, but you kind of get the picture. I mean, there's some people that run around, you know, like with the Spirit of God, like a balloon, and they they get all blown up, and then they hold on to one end of it, and they let go, and they... <laughs> That's kind of what they do when they speak in tongues. Now, I believe in speaking in tongues. It's very pragmatic to me. I hear people speak in tongues. I know what they're saying. It's just pretty simple. It's like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. Praise the Lord. Thank you. You know, it doesn't get all weird for me. Um, other people, you know, they want to talk in a different language. They go, well, they start talking in some language. You know, they seem to understand me. I don't know what I'm saying, but they seem to know. I'm like, okay. I was told that, you know, you could do that. So I've done that and had no problem with that. And it always works. At least God makes it work which is why the Bible works. Not because you make it work, but because God makes it work. It's the same way with anything spiritual. You can't make your gift work. The Spirit of God makes it work. You can't get some gift. The Spirit of God gives you gifts. You can't instigate some power of God. God does it by his own power. You see, somewhere in the line there, you're going to figure out there's another man in the boat. Somewhere you're going to figure out there's more to make a boat float than just having a boat. It's got to be blown up with something. Air. Now, I would say hot air would work, but that's for balloons floating in the sky. I'm not going to go into hot air balloons because I don't really want to be like those politicians I'm hearing nowadays. But when it comes to water, when it comes to walking on water, swimming, maybe sometimes going underwater, maybe baptism, you know, getting a little splish splash, cleaned up, maybe sometimes looking at humanity as water or the oceans or the seas, 
maybe when it comes to explaining teachings according to my kayak, then maybe you could call me the kayak a new preacher. <laughs> Preaching on the outside of the church. But really, what we want to do in kayak a new is to bring to our attention those things that God wants to bring in contention with but may be taught out there in the world. Maybe it's not so good to have all your time being spent except for maybe a missionary trip or a vacation in Israel or you know a renovation house project that you decided to do for some poor people down in Mexico. Maybe there needs to be those renovations, vacations, and explanations inside you that you are ready for the soon return of Jesus Christ. Maybe you are like the disciples that were in the boat, that you went, Oh no, we perished! Ah! And you need to wake Jesus up. Maybe you need to wake Jesus up in you so that he can save you from what you think is going to kill you. Hmm. I know, when I was drowning, and I didn't even know I was drowning, in the Green River, I was fascinated because my thought process is, you know, I'm always thinking about what I'm thinking about. I mean, I don't know if you do that, but it's funny, amusing story I got to tell you real quick. You believe that real quick? <laughs> Boy, you don't know me very well, do you? <laughs> As Tweety said to Sylvester, Sylvester, pretty sure, or to somebody. But they don't know me very well, do they? <laughs> but the fact is, about drowning, which now I'm thinking, did I lose my chain of thought because I'm in a lot of pain from my shoulder? But anyways, the fact about drowning was that it was interesting that my thought process, my wife has been learning about Jewish thought. She's been reading the book by James Michener called The Source. The Source by James Michener takes a setting in Israel Makor or Makor and in Makor it's a area that Michener starts from prehistoric times you know and describes what's going on in the land all the way up to modern day giving a history of the Jews history of Israel Palestinians yes they were Palestinians Arabs tribes tribesmen even Bedouin and Quite a few other tri uh, gypsies. I don't think. Well, I'm not sure if if uh, Michener mentions the gypsies, but the gypsies have been in Israel as long as Israelis have been in Israel. I didn't know if you knew that, but yeah, there are gypsies that live in Israel. I met them. You know, I was there. I met one of the families that have been there for thousands of years, <laughs> long time. <laughs> yeah, probably back to Ezra. But anyways, the fact of the matter is this that. She was reading a, a chapter in the book about the Council of Yavne. And most Americans think of council. Like, you know, you sit around, you know, in council, you know, you get these round tables or you get a table or you get, you know, a bunch of people together. And for a couple hours, you know, you have a topic and you discuss it, you know, and then you're done. Or like, you know, on television, how you see, you know, at the beginning of the story, then by the end of the half hour or hour, it's all wrapped up in a nice bundle. That's not Jewish thought. <laughs> In the Council of Yavne, they'll take a subject, and like you've heard of Strong's exhaustive concordance, they'll exhaust whatever it is the topic is, discussing all aspects of the, I want to say ramifications, but there's more to it than that. It's not just the ramifications, but it's lifestyle choice, it's spiritual realities, it's physical manifestations, it's implications, it's attitudes of art. I mean, you talk about everything about one little thing, even one dot or tittle, like Jesus said, that doesn't depart from the law. In the Council of Yavne, they would understand that. And so the process is to think about things for years and keep discussing it for years. Not old discussions, new aspects of refining that thought. That's why even Missler in his teachings on the on the survey of the Bible talked about one of the Jewish 
rabbis who just studied Genesis came up with all nine dimensions, I think there are, or 12 dimensions, that we're still only arguing about, you know, three or four of them? Huh. Yeah, right, okay, you guys are catching up real fast. Hmm. Got a long ways to go for that one, don't you? And he just did it through Bible study. They are still talking about it theoretically through mathematical equations. And then everybody wants to go to some guy that's paralyzed, you know, and ask him about it. Hello? Go to the Bible. That's what they did at the Council of Yavne, and the rabbi came up with all those dimensions from just studying the Torah, the Bible, in Genesis, of all things. Just Genesis. Huh. <laughs> so, why did I say all that? The reason is because my mind thinks like that, and I like that. I actually never knew that other people don't think like that. Like, I'm not used to the concept of a superficial thought. You know, superficiality, I understand, because frankly, I think it's sales and lying, but I never realized that people don't think through or think about what they do or what they read or what they said or anything else about what's going on in life in general. I'm observant, not as a Jew, but observant of all that's occurring in life because God gave me life. I am knowledgeable where my hands just went, where my eyebrows arched, or how my articulation of my lips went, or my nose flared, or you know maybe my pupils dilated. You know I'm conscious of the very fact that I can see my eyelashes, you know, and they're right there in the halfway mark between you know looking at you and seeing them as looking through them because I have long eyelashes and I'm beautiful. <laughs> Or at least I was when I was a little baby. But the point being is that not everyone, I guess, is conscious or, as some people used to say in the 60s, living in the now. They have to go to yoga classes. Now, some Christian's going to go, you can't do yoga. You know, or karate classes, you know. They can't do karate because you're going to learn all these other things. Well, no, you know, if you're going to pick up all the false religion, yeah. But, if, you know, don't go to a yoga class that has false religion. But the Bible says about meditation or about think on these things. Jesus said think on these things. So the Council of the Avne was about thinking and on these things. And the fact that most Christians don't think about it shows you why the faith movement really devastated a lot of Christianity. Because to me, anything that requires faith is logical. I mean, I don't have a problem with when somebody does something outside the norm and expects God to be real with it because God might have said it. So it's perfectly logical to me. If you got creator of the universe, something God said, what couldn't he do? And unfortunately, limited minds in theology have tried to play with, he can't create something bigger than he can lift up, sure he can. He can't create something that can't be lifted up that's bigger than he is or whatever, sure he can. Because he can outweigh or outthink and out parameterize, parameterize your logic to a degree that it does make sense, but not in your dimension, not in your limited focal point. And that's why in really, <laughs> I start saying video, but it really in Kayakanu, we're going to change your way of thinking to get outside of the church, to go outside of your pew, because, frankly, I think there's some stinking thinking going on in the pews. And that's what we're going to talk about a lot, probably, in the kayak. Because, I don't know about you, but my kayak has fishing poles. Okay, this isn't a real fishing pole. I have to still go buy one. That's my wife's duty. You see, we figured out recently that unless I get my wife involved, you know, she doesn't get super thrilled about kayaking because... Every time there's two of us in one kayak, it's kind of like Christianity. When the two of us are working together in the kayak, somebody's going to get thrown overboard, and it ain't me. She's sitting in the front, I'm getting wet. Figure that one out. It's kind of like one of these row things, you know? Well, you don't row to put water in the boat. So you know how well we work together. Yeah. <laughs> Although, when we first got the boat, we, we did pretty good. Now, she hated white water, so it took a while, but I finally convinced her to go down the Eber or Eber or Weber or Weber River, and she, you know, got terrified, <laughs> but she survived it in this boat, 
which is 10 feet long and is a little too cramped for two people. But, you know, right next to me over here, wait till tomorrow, is, uh, or maybe later today, I might record for tomorrow, the Sea Eagle 370. We finally got it. And that's a real kayak. Anyway. Or it's a real kayak canoe because it's built just like this. It's really scary when it looks just like this one. And this is a knockout that's not rated. And that's rated for Class 3 whitewater. And she's pretty. 12 feet, 4 inches. Yeah. Where are we going to put them? Good thing they deflate. Kind of like what people do a lot. Inflate, deflate. Escalate. Hmm. Inspirate. Although that's not really a word. Inspire. But with this kayak, I figured out that, you know, we need to do something in the boat together when we're on lakes that are still water, streams that are still water. And something else besides just me getting in the kayak and going crazy, you know, wanting to be, yeah, let's go my water, you know. Yeah, let's go whitewater. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. <laughs> Minions. But uh, that's about the way my whitewater experiences are so far. Minions. <laughs> minion, 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 minion. But um, fishing seems to be one of those things that I don't fish. You know, I caught a king salmon with my thumb, you know, in Alaska, and since then, never fished. I'd flick them out of the river with a board or send my dogs to go grab them out of the river, but... Just never really got into this thing that people do called fishing. So my wife is going to be the ministry of fishing. <laughs> the pastor of fishing. Boy, don't you just hate what evangelicals are doing to the word pastor? I mean, the pastor of toilets, the pastor of parking lots, the pastor of assembling people together, the pastor of, of uh, sitting people in pews, the pastor of worshiping guitars, the pastor of promoting movies. I mean, come on. You know, isn't, aren't we past that yet? <laughs> but okay, if you want to make everybody have a title, you know, Jesus kind of warned about that. But anyways, my wife, you know, she seems to know fishing somewhat, and she said she likes fishing, so we're going to try to incorporate, as these kayaks are really designed somewhat for fishing, pretty, pretty much so, you know, fishing so that I have two spots here that hold fishing rods. And then there's another spot that goes right about here, if you can see this, that actually I have a little taller than that mini mass that has a sail that is like a, can't think of what the bottom sail is called. That's just a boom, you know, it's just kind of like a sheet that kind of curls. It goes one way. It's on sailboats. A jib sale, I think, or something like that. But anyways, I've already designed it, rigged it up, and it's already ready for these ropes, but it um, pulls the kayak along. So, you know, we'll have a mini sail. She won't have one in the Sea Eagle. She won't let me touch the Sea Eagle, by the way. The Sea Eagle is like clean machine, man. But here, we had to, because it's a knockout, improvise after Green River, because there was a lot of issues with the boat that had to be repaired and changed and reevaluated and adapted and kind of like, you know, rather than just simply do like most Americans do, get frustrated and hack my boat apart and start over, we uh, prayed about it. Wow, that's a novel idea. And God said, Fabricate. <laughs> because I came from a journeyman boiler maker background. I know what fabricate means. It means that you see that weld over there? Well, knock the weld out, cut it off, redo it, and just weld it back, and guess what? That's fabricate. If it didn't fit, make it fit. It's not good in scriptures. But in the business world, fabrication is a lot of what people do because they lie a lot. And fabrication sometimes involves lying. But this boat is modified in order to be able to go places I want it to go. As you can see, the waterproof bag on the front tip nose, and you can't see my little minion sitting here waving at me. Hi. Yeah, you know the minions. 
But we want to take the Bible, the Word of God, the experiences I've experienced as a Jesus freak, which is what most people wanted to be or say they did. They never, trust me, you don't want to be a Jesus freak. You want to be a Jesus people person, but you don't want to be a Jesus freak because Jesus freaks really did live pretty weird. I mean, out on the edge, going extremes that you won't do, like Keith Green, you know, was an extremist and, you know, a lot of people like them after they're dead, but not while they're alive. And, you know, me, sometimes I don't get invited places because they don't want me around. I might bring up something they uh, have a little hot under the collar about. But love is the key. The Spirit of God leads us, and it's the Word of God that makes applicable our lives to being made conformable into the image of the Son of God like I'm making this boat conformable into what God wants to use it for in going out into the waters of life and to enjoy as we go down this road together through the rivers and through the white waters and through the storms and the winds and the rain to be able to not be like the disciples in the boat that are panicking and shaking the Messiah, the Master, to wake him up from the sleep that he probably needed and saying, Oh God, we're perishing! And God says, uh, you evaluated the situation wrong. You got me. What are you worried about? And that's what I want to remind you of in what you're doing. Don't panic. Don't worry. Rather, get with the program. Get with the life experiences that God is giving you. If you want to go learn theology, then, you know, go waste your time. I don't care. You know, I mean, if that's going to help you, it'll help you some. But really, God will teach you everything you need to know through everyday life as he did with his disciples. He lived with them and they lived with him and they learned. That's how we learn, by applying that with which we've heard, that which we've seen, and that which we've handled with our own hands. Today, as we read this, we know that it must be God that's teaching us, for it cannot be of our own learning that we say that we are the masters and the teachers, but rather we acknowledge that we are the children of God and that we have something to learn from God Almighty himself. And that is, he knows the way that I take, and when he has tried me, I shall come forth his goal. Now, what does that mean? I mean, are you thinking about it when he says, uh, he knows the way that I take? In other words, there's a certain amount of two process here. Not only does he know the way that I take, but he knows that I'm the one taking it. He knows you're on a journey. He knows you're going to make decisions, maybe not the best. Maybe you've already done that. And maybe you think you either got away with it or didn't get away with it, and you know and are embarrassed by what you did do or didn't do. Well, he knows that. The fact is, the reality of truth is the acknowledgement that we know he knows, and that we admit it to ourselves. We don't have to profess it to some other we're Christian. We don't have to tell the world about the truth. God knows we're the ones that have to learn the truth, not the world. We have to admit to ourselves that he knows. And then when we see that he has tried me, that means he's going to test you. Everything you learn, every single day, every moment of your life, you need to open the book of James. Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall in diverse trials and tribulations, knowing that the working of your faith produces patience, and that patience have its perfect work, that the man of God might be fully equipped, ready for every circumstance, situation, certain whatever that comes up in life. My point being is that every single breath you take is a test. Do you give thanks and praise to God for the reality of the breathing that you're going on? And the Jew in the Orthodox community would say, yeah, I do. Well, that's nice. You know, how does it affect you? Not at all, but I do give thanks. <laughs> okay. See, in some ways, with the variety, as we'll see in the scripture that later on mentions it, there is, a, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wooden of earth and some to honor and some to dishonor. In other words, there's always going to be inside of the church or inside of your life or inside of the house or inside of your own actions, those things that are gold and silver and wonderful, you know, like uh, my uh, fishing pole. All that needs is a string and a hook. No, this, this is not a fishing pole. We're going to get some good ones. But it's kind of like, you know, you know what's good in your life and what's bad and what shouldn't be there. And then with hay and stubble, there's things that need to be removed and things that are going to be consumed and things that are going to perish in your life and in your church and in your ministry and in your marriage and in your children's lives and in the world. Dare I say, politics is wood hay and stubble. It ain't going to last. It's going to 
poof, be gone very quickly. As soon as someone gets elected, go see how fast they fulfill everything you wanted from them. Not at all. But the trying of your faith is meant to produce in you the realization that he knows. He accepts the fact that you don't. You need to accept the fact that because he knows, you can put your trust in where he puts you. I have this yellow submarine. At least it was for you know a little while on the Green River. But I have this kayak canoe that is a Intex Explorer K2. It is rated for nothing. <laughs> it is qualified for float your boat in a lake where there's no wind and no rain and no storm and no current. Because otherwise, you're liable to get killed. Like I almost did. But taking and making certain changes in it, knowing that the style is based upon the Sea Eagle 370 kayak, this kayak canoe I have remodeled by way of help from God to become a fit vessel that is able to be used for whitewater class 3, to be used for long distance expedition campings, to be able to go into the Grand Canyon, not the big whitewater ones, but the, you know, still water gorges and to camp out. Then I have my sleeping bags, and I have my wet gear, and I have my dry gear, and I have my chairs, and I have my food. I don't take guns, sorry, I have a knife, you know, or a machete to cut the bushes, you know. But to take fishing, you know, here, because I, you know, I go fishing the most. But, you know, with my wife, yes, by myself, doubtful. But, you know, to take food, too, because I have all this camping gear food that I take along, you know, like cookies and Pepsi. And, no, not the kind of camping gear you do, the kind that I do. <laughs> yeah, I take junk food. But, you know, that's the idea, is that I could have said, oh, well, this is not qualified, this is not quantified, this is not what God wants a kayak to be, and then went out and spent a ridiculous amount of money, which we didn't for the Kayak 370, we bought a used one. But, you know, I mean, I could have bought an expensive kayak in the first place. That one wasn't. This one was barely a hundred bucks. Now, I had seen some other inflatable boats that were didn't look right, prayed about them, and they didn't sound right, and God didn't let me get them. But this one I got, and man, it's been fun. So God has used it to remodel into what he wants to use it for, like me. I was not fit for the kingdom of God. I was not able to be used by God. I could not have kept anyone afloat in their life, much less given them the wisdom that I've learned over 40 years. But because of what the Spirit of God has done in my life and I've experienced with God, that means that as long as God is in my boat, which is what keeps it afloat, then as long as this boat floats, then guess what? I do have and I am fit to be that minister, that preacher, that teacher, that evangelist, that pastor, that elder, that deacon, that beacon of light that Jesus said were the salt of the earth and the light of the world. I am because he is. And such is this kind of canoe as you'll see as we teach from it. We'll be out on the water at times, sharing, because summer's over, and while we prepare to do it during the summer, things didn't work out. Kind of like I have a, what they call a, probably a um, kind of a bicep tendonitis that they may have to cut these two muscles up here that go all the way down because of the severe pain I'm in. You know, and you go, what severe pain? Drugs? Hello? <laughs> I mean, even the drugs aren't working that good because I'm coherent. But, dare I say, yeah, I'm hurting on both sides, probably from kayaking, you know. But the point being is this. We're all in a boat, some way in time, some point in time. We all got to get to the other side of the lake or the river. We all have to, at some point, at some pressure point, realize that we can't do it without Jesus, and we must call upon the name of the Lord to be saved saved from our own stupidity, saved from our own examples, saved from our own life, saved from religion, saved from politics, saved from social causes that, you know, people get wrapped up into, like this Kim Davis thing. Give me a break. That's not Christian. Or Mike Huckabee. I have never seen Mike Huckabee do anything Christian lately. He's a very good politician, but he, as far as a pastor's concerned, I wouldn't send anybody to his church. Sorry. That's the way it is. I'd rather have him in the boat 
and have him teach me about what it means to live life risking your life in following Jesus wherever he goes, whatever he does, and however he lives. For Jesus said that foxes have holes, birds have their nests, but nowhere has the Son of Man to lay his head. Every kayak trip I take, I take everything and so it will my last. And I live my life the same way. Ask my wife, she knows even to this day. Hey, you know, we get in the car, you know, good luck. You take your life in your own hands. Just kidding, honey. That was a joke. But no, seriously. When it comes to the everyday reality of what life was meant to be, no man knows the day or the hour of their death. It's not meant to be you're supposed to be looking for the rapture because you don't know the day or the hour. You're supposed to be aware that any day you could drop dead, folks. <laughs> Seriously. Or get killed by a car or you know something that you call an accident. God said, your time's up. Whew, you're dead. That's it. Sorry, Red. Sorry, blonde. Sorry, black hair. Sorry, whatever. That's over. The point being is that God's still in control. Nothing happens without his knowledge or without his allowing or without his planning. Everything does have a purpose and a plan in life. It's not purpose driven. It's God living. Yeah, living according to the will of God. Because this is all God's will. It is God's will that Satan has a time and a place and a season to be the God of this world. But he's defeated and he shall be eventually removed from the world. Until then, even our flesh rebels against us. So we have a life to live that should be according to the measure of faith we've been given that can go forward in a kayak like this to modify it for what you need it for at that particular time. And I'll show you a lot of tips and tricks and, t and ideas along the way about Christianity that will save you experiences you don't need. For instance, reading your Bible from Genesis to Revelation is boring. My wife reads it every day. Boring. You ask her what she remembers? Nothing. Seriously. She don't remember any of it. Now, reading the source at night before she goes to bed, which is going to take her 10 years, but you know, she reads about a half, of, what, half a page and falls asleep. But reading the source, she kind of connects some of the dots now with what she read in the Bible. She goes, oh, that's like that. You know, and I'm like, yeah, you know, you're getting it. So the fact that she reads it is good, but what you should do and what really will save you a lot of time is think about it. I took one scripture out of today's devotion, and that was, He knows the way that I take. When He has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And we explored and explained and expositionally applied just one scripture without taking it out of context, without it being removed from the knowledge and the relationship of having a personal revelation by the Spirit of God, of the Word of God, to the people of God, of Jesus, so that you would know that God himself is teaching you and not this guy that's sitting in the boat with you experiencing the rapids of life, but going through also the still waters that Jesus said he would bring you to. I look forward to this winter to be able to take this kayak out in some pretty cold weather without getting wet and sitting out on a lake and watching the moon rise or the stars come out or just sitting there in the water, just, dare I say, <sighs> at peace. You betcha. <laughs> when I was in Alaska, I remember enjoying a certain amount of time that was totally removed from humanity, all alone, very much different places. I remember safety checkpoint out on the I did her on trail. I was the manager there. I was at the last checkpoint before you come to Nome, Alaska at the end of the Did Around Trail. I was managing that. Now, how many people came every day? None. How many people stopped by? None. How many people were within 30 miles? None. Oh, I had to keep the generator going in the winter. And before, you know, until the I did her on, nothing happened there. But we kept the generator running. That's all. All by myself. Oh. I forgot to tell you, and Jesus. <laughs> so you see, you're never alone. You know, you may need to be put in remembrance of things by maybe getting in a boat too. Maybe coming, you know, if you stop by, hey, I'll put you in the boat, you know, and we can record together. Or I'll take you out on a kayak trip, you know, if you happen to be there at the time. But one of the things we don't do is we don't go back. You don't start a trip and then go back to the beginning. You don't repeat the crucifixion in order to save someone from their cells. 
You don't go back and try to ask God to forgive you again and again and again, when in reality you move forward out of this idea of repentance to the idea of, hey, I know I'm a sinner, forgive me and help me to not sin, not to just keep repeating it. But also recognizing that maybe it's not about watching out for that sin, but moving forward and to begin to do what God wants you to do, which is to teach about what sin is and how it does affect all of us. And we all need grace and mercy in this time we're living. So in our Kayak Anu series, we don't want to get sidetracked. And we'll talk about all the different eddies and flows of the river, because Whenever there's a big boulder in the river, you'll see that the current hits it and then behind the boulder is still waters. It's an eddy that you can pull behind and you can sit there in calm waters. But it goes nowhere. It goes nowhere. A lot of your distractions in life are going nowhere. Politics is one of them. It goes nowhere. You're not going to accomplish anything if you're wasting your time in what's called Christian politics. Same thing with, dare I say, abortion. You know, social cause, wonderful. Are you dealing with the man? Well, the man doesn't have anything to do with abortion. Oh yeah, he does. According to God, abortions are caused by men because you can't have an abortion without a man involved. So if you're not dealing with the man who is the instigator of the necessity of having the abortion, what are you dealing with the woman for? Is it her fault or is it the man whose seed is born by the woman that committed the sin in the first place? You see, you don't even understand the issues unless you have been there and you've already talked to God about it. So don't get distracted by the boulders in the river because they just simply steer the river a certain way. You go around the rocks, not over them, not under them, and you don't drown by them like I almost did. But rather you learn to deal with them on a consistent basis and then you'll become a kayaker like me. I hope you do. Because we'll share this word for you so that you have a little more of the word of God, even though I've quoted it without using numbers so you could find it. But let's just consider the rest of the devotion that's been said in this so that you would be provoked unto seeking the Lord and to find He has for you a plan and a purpose. Show me thy ways, O Lord, and teach me thy paths. Moses said unto the Lord, I pray thee, if I have found grace, if I have found grace in your sight, then you show me your way that I may know you. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest, Moses. He made known his ways unto Moses and his acts unto the children of Israel and how he did things and does things. The meek will he guide in judgment and the meek will he teach his way. What man is he that fears the Lord? That man is whom the Lord shall teach his way. And that is the man whom the Lord shall choose. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. You will show me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I will instruct you. I will teach you. I will teach you in the way which you shall go, and I will guide you with my own eye. The path of the just is as the shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. I pray thee then that you would follow the Lord and not men. Because there's current popularity in following a favorite pastor or a powerful worship leader or the presence that you think you're following or the inspiration of some prophecy scholar or some salesman who's selling you his political ideas, or you know, some prosperity that you found that God causes the wicked and the good to have the sun to shine and the rain to fall. So the fact that you're prospering doesn't mean you're a Christian. It just means that so too are the wicked and the good. The reality of having God with you is having Jesus in you. And I pray then you will follow Jesus more than you follow men. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord our God make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord my God lift up his countenance upon you 
And may Jesus, by his Spirit, give you peace.